Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 23 on laser cooling. So, can lasers actually cool things? You normally think of lasers as making things hot, like cutting through pieces of metal or firing rockets out of the sky or something. But uh, very clever people have come up with multiple schemes of cooling things down with lasers. I'm going to describe one of them that's used to cool ions in... Uh, various electromagnetic traps and uh, see how that works. It relates to the quantum computing because in order to use ions in a quantum computer you need to cool them down enough that they're in a well-known quantum state. So first of all let me point out that if you uh, immerse an ion in a strong laser field it will periodically produce a spontaneous photon. It'll continuously be excited and then re-emit and excited and re-emit. Uh, some of those emissions will be st stimulated emissions, uh, and those don't have any net effect because you absorb a photon and you emit a photon in the same direction, and the net change in momentum is going to be zero. But the spontaneous emissions do produce a net momentum effect, and uh, that's what we're after. So this is a function that describes the number of uh, spontaneous transitions per second as a function of, of the frequency of the laser. So omega zero is the resonant frequency, that's the energy difference between the two states in the ion that the electron is transitioning between, divided by h-bar. And gamma, we learned about that last time, gamma is <coughs> essentially uh, a damping factor. It it relates to the lifetime of the excited state. It's basically uh, <coughs> one over the lifetime or the rate at which the excited state is depopulated. And uh, just to give you rough numbers, uh, omega zero tends to be on the order of 10 to the 15 cycles a second. Gamma is more like 10 to the nine uh, or many times 10 to the eight um, cycles a second. And so uh, omega zero is much, much larger than gamma. Now, if you make a graph of this function, uh, and here I've exaggerated gamma in order to see what the function looks like, but in fact, gamma is going to be a very tiny thing, and it will be an extremely sharp spike. N zero is the number of uh, spontaneous transitions per second. If omega is equal to omega zero, and, uh, of course, if omega is not equal to omega zero, you get a smaller number than that, depending on how far away you are from omega zero. So that's the idea. Now, uh, the point of laser cooling is you've got this uh, ion that's moving, and you immerse that in a laser beam, and you set the laser frequency to be just a little bit less than the resonant frequency. So... Uh, omega L is somewhat less than omega zero by about gamma over two. The key is you want the laser frequency to be at a point in the curve where the slope is very large. So the notion is uh, a photon comes in, hits the ion, and the ion absorbs that momentum. If a spontaneous transition occurs, a photon is emitted, and there's a recoil momentum, that the ion experiences as a result. And the sum of those two is the net change in momentum of the ion. The, uh, the interesting thing is the absorbed momentum is always in the direction of the laser beam. The emitted momentum is in a random direction. So if you average this over many, many interactions, the spontaneous emission produces no net momentum change. But the laser always producing a momentum in the same direction does produce a net momentum change or a net rate of change of momentum. And so it produces a kind of uh, radiation force or radiation pressure. And, uh, and you'd say, well, that's interesting. It kind of pushes on the ion, but uh, how does it cool? The, uh, the thing is, the average force of this radiation pressure is a function of omega. So it's the momentum of a single photon times the rate at which these spontaneous transitions occur. And if you think about that, the issue is what is the value of the frequency that you need to put into the function n of omega? And the answer is 
you need to put in the Doppler shifted frequency. In other words, the frequency is going to be Doppler shifted by the motion of the ion. If the ion's moving fast, you put in a lower frequency. But what that does is it reduces n of omega because of where the laser frequency sits. It's on this, this uh, highly sloped region of the function n of omega. If the ion is moving fast, it shifts omega to the left. That drops the force. If it's moving very slowly, or if it moves in the other direction, it'll shift omega up, <coughs> excuse me, and that will increase the force. So we have a force that varies as a function of velocity. And that turns out to be the important idea. So n of omega has a large slope. And if you think about it, if you put that omega into the function n of omega, and expand that as a kind of a Taylor series, what we have is n of omega l plus delta omega, but that's n minus n prime times delta omega. And if you put all that together, notice that n prime is positive. All those other factors are positive. And the minus sign comes from the Doppler shift. And you can see that what we get is a damping effect. So what you see is that the you get a velocity dependent force or you get a average force minus a velocity dependent damping factor. Very interesting. Now let's go back for a second and remember that this is an ion not in empty space but in an, in an ion trap. So there is a um, restoring force from the ion trap that we worked out a few several lessons ago and I have to add this new laser force to that force and I get a net force that has the restoring force, the constant force from the laser beam, and then the damping force. If I put all that together and take the component of R in the direction of the laser beam, I get an equation that you probably will recognize. It's the simple harmonic oscillator, the damped simple harmonic oscillator equation. You guys have all solved this probably a hundred times before. And you know that uh, as long as gamma is less than 2m omega, that the thing is underdamped, and that means there's an underdamped frequency, omega sub d. And if you solve this thing, cook up a, uh, a characteristic equation and solve it for the frequencies, um, the two roots, you get a solution that looks something like this. If I make a graph of this thing, it's a damped sort of sinusoid, but the uh, the effect of the of the laser is to shift the equilibrium position by a little bit that depends on the average laser force but it does ultimately damp out the motion okay so here is a little demo i i modified the ion trap code remember in the original version that we worked with before i had put in some artificial damping just to kind of slowly slow down the ion but what I've done to this in this case is I've I've introduced this n factor function, which is the the basically the broadening factor. I've got the line width squared divide the line width over two squared divided by the line width over two squared plus the difference between the omega prime, the Doppler shifted frequency, and the resonant frequency squared. So this is the factor that determines depending on the Doppler shifted frequency, what the number of photons uh, spontaneously emitted per second is going to be. And then in the loop that computes the new position of the ion, uh, the, the force responsible for the trapping, the, the trap forces are computed in a, in a uh, Runge-Kutta, fourth order Runge-Kutta update. And then on each time step, I go through and create a number of photons, generate a, that number of random numbers to get the uh, distribution of cosines. Now remember, the, to generate a uniform distribution of solid uh, angles, or a uniform distribution of thetas and phis, you can set the cosine of theta to be a uniformly distributed random number between uh, negative one and plus one. And the, um, the sine of theta is, of course, just the square root of 1 minus cosine theta squared. Phi is a uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 2 pi. And then sine theta cosine phi 
sine theta sine phi, I can compute directly. And then the idea is I give the, um, I add up those kicks <coughs> produced by each of those uh, spontaneous events and add those to the velocity of the ion. So basically, I'm giving the ion an extra little kick in each time step that's determined by the rate at which spontaneous events are occurring, and they're occurring in random directions, in all directions of space. Uh, in addition to, of course, the uh, laser beam, which produces a uh, steady state, uh, what you call kicks, that, that's taken care of here. Notice that the kick in the z direction is 1 minus cosine theta. The 1 is from the laser beam. The minus cosine theta is from the uh, spontaneously emitted photon, or the spontaneous transition. Okay, so let's see what happens. I'll go ahead and run it, and you notice we've got the, uh, it's the old Paul trap there in view. And there's added here a little cylinder that represents the laser beam. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the ion going. I want you to notice at first, uh, it takes off in this direction. The laser beam is pushing the ion to the left in this view. And so the ion never even makes it back to the origin because of the uh, radiation pressure from the ion beam. But another dramatic thing is you can see that the, dr the motion in the z direction is seriously damped out. In fact, after only a couple of cycles, uh, it's almost completely damped out. But if you look in the x and y direction, you can see that the motion is still going pretty strong. Um, it looks like a Lissajou figure or something. But in the z direction, um, all the motion along that uh, laser beam trajectory is damped out. So the thing really does damp. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is actually uh, solving the equations of motion, uh, not making the fast slow approximation, so you can still see the fast motion in there. Let's see if I can zoom in here to take a look at it. There's the fast motion. <coughs> and it's simulating the uh, spontaneous photon emissions and the laser absorptions. Uh, in each time step. So it seems like it's uh, it's kind of holding water that this uh, this seems to work. All right. Now there is a limit as the uh, as the thing cools down, every photon that's emitted produces a little bit of momentum, and that uh, means that the thing gets down to some low temperature, but it never gets below a temperature. Uh, where Kb is about equal to p squared over 2m, where p is the recoil momentum of a single photon. If, uh, if you need a lower temperature than that in order to do quantum computing, and unfortunately it turns out many times you do need a lower temperature than this recoil limit, you need to pull some other tricks. And uh, we'll talk about some of those tricks, and in fact I found a lovely article out of Los Alamos um, that, uh, that describes some of the tricks people are doing, and uh, we can talk about those in class. Also, I'll have some board work for you guys to do today relating to this material, but that's the basic idea. See you then.